Well, hello everyone, this is Laboratory Tech 13 here of the Riptide Project Laboratory, and today we have got something special for you. The first magic story of Dominaria was released today, and of course was written by the lovely, talented Martha Wells. And today we are actually going to do a quick read-through of the story. I'm actually quite good at reading stories aloud, so of course you'll be able to, you know, check out all the cool new happenings in Dominaria. Of course they don't talk about me, because uh, I'm on a different alternate history in Dominaria, so it's not exactly what's going on currently, but, you know, it's kind of close. It's nice to see exactly what's happening on the other side, if you will. So, anyway, let's go ahead and get started with the first reading of the magic story of Dominaria. So, let's go ahead and put the story up on the screen. Uh, let's go ahead and transition over to that. Okay, there it is. Uh, and what's really interesting about this story is that they have basically world-renowned, world-class authors that are going to be writing the story uh, from here on out. Uh, and I think it's a fantastic idea. It gets not only the authors uh, a little bit more uh, exposure, which I think is going to be also really good, but also uh, it will allow the stories to have a more cohesive treatment and feel like they are coming from uh, one source, one place, uh, and I'm really excited to see what's going on there. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and start with Return to Dominaria, Episode 1. Now you can see right here, we have the map of Dominaria, the actual real map of Dominaria, the updated map. And I see Oteria on there, I see my little hometown there, it's pretty good, I can maybe even see my house from here, uh, eh, not really. Uh, so anyway, let's go ahead and start with the reading, okay? So, Chapter 1. Sadage, cleric of the Cabal, made his way to the doors of the high-vaulted worship hall of the Stronghold. Smoke from torches and incense burners formed a cloud above the cultists sprawled on the stone floor. They begged for entrance to the hall, begged for the favor of the scion of darkness within. A group of dark-robed disciples approached from the other direction, picking their way around the moaning supplicants to meet Sadage. He recognized the leader as Needle, an agent of the Cabal tasked with infiltrating New Argyle. As the group reached him, they dropped to their knees. You've returned, said Sadage. I hope for a worthwhile reason. In answer, Needle unwrapped a large black sword, holding it up for acceptance. I bring you a gift. For the Scion of Darkness. A gift? Sadage reached for it, but stopped. A breath of air between his gloved tips and the metal. A dark miasma clung to the blade. What is this? Nita looked up at him, her eyes wide. The dark pupils dilated with reverence. A fabled blade. A soul drinker. The one who forged the sword killed an elder dragon and absorbed its strength. Sadage said, stop. This close to the worship hall and its resplendent occupant, he couldn't afford to let discipline slip. Who used it to kill an elder dragon? Needle hesitated. The disciple at her side said, It said it was the plate of Mocker Dak and Bleh. Sadage made a sharp gesture. It was Belzenlock. Belzenlock forged it. Belzenlock slayed the elder dragon. Belzenlock. In a murmuring chorus, the group of disciples repeated obediently, It was Belzenlock, Lord of the Waste, Belzenlock, Slayer of Elder Dragons. Needle added, This is his sword, Belzenlock, King of Urborg, Demon Lord. I return it to him. And there you can see the awesome Black Blade Reforged. Very good. Sadich took the sword from Needle's hand. The contact made his skin burn, even through his gloves. You have earned your reward. Needle smiled, trembling as she pushed to her feet. She pulled her hood down, baring her throat. Sadich lifted his hand and cast the spell. Slowly, Needle's skin peeled from her chest as the violet spell light gently the violet spell light gently pierced her heart. 
as Needle writhed in exultant death, the other disciples watched in jealous awe. Sadich opened the doors to the worship hall, ready to present the Black Blade to his chosen master, ready to collect his own final reward from the Demon Lord. Wow. Chapter 2 Joyra leaned forward over her diving ship's control wheel and breathed, That's it! She pulled a lever to stop their forward motion. It had been an artistic choice to shape the underwater ship like a large metal-plated fish, with fins for locomotion and steering and two bulbous ports in the bow like giant eyes. But it moved through the difficult sea currents like a dream. Outside the ports, silvery fish flickered away through the sandy water, confused by the narrow beams of lights and the strange metal fish pushing through the seaweed forest. Hottie, her assistant artificer, grabbed for the support rail as the ship jolted with the current. He leaned down to look through the second port. Where? He was an older man and had come to Talaran Academy from Jamura. That he had agreed to help her on this wild quest said a lot about his sense of adventure. Joyra adjusted the wheel more carefully and pointed, her finger almost touching the curved glass. There, you see? It seemed obvious to her. The long spine half buried in the muck and water reeds was too straight for any natural formation, at least in this bay. But then she knew that shape so well, it was like greeting an old friend. Check out the Joyra art right there, it's actually fantastic. You've got sharp eyes, Hottie said, and pulled down the speaking tube for her. I thought there would be more left of it. Not after so long. Jorah took the speaking tube and called into it. Ziva, I'm directing my lights toward it. Can you see it? The tube sent her voice through the water, transformed into vibrations the Vodalian Merfolk could understand. Outside, Ziva swam down, the pa swam down past the port, the silt in the water dimming the deep purples and blues of the natural armor on her arms and flanks. Ziva paused long enough to signal an ascent toward the port, then with the flick of her powerful tail, she disappeared into the murk. Joyra waited for the verdict, trying not to bounce with tension like body. Then Ziva reappeared and swam closer to the metal fish until she bumped against the hull. Her tail curled past the port, and Joyra heard her fumble for the outside end of the speaking tube. Then Ziva's voice was transported into the compartment. It's lying on a shelf, trapped by saltweed and sand, but no rocks, she reported. We should have no trouble raising it to the surface, if the price remains the same. Yes, just as I hoped, Joyra thought. It was hard to contain her glee, but they had a lot of hard work ahead. The price is doubled if you can bring it up within two days, she told Ziva. The merfolk needed the money, and Joyra had no problem paying for something that would be the culminations of culmination of years of careful work and planning. Ziva's laugh was like bubbling water. You'll have it in one! Dora sat back against the worn leather of the pilot seat. The heady combination of relief and renewed purpose made her want to dance. Later, she promised herself. When she stood on the shore beside it, then she'd dance. I knew we could do it. You knew it, Hottie told her, sounding elated. I'm not sure anyone else believed it was possible. Well, they'll believe it now, Joyra said. The rest of the merfolk swooped in to join Ziva, gliding in patterns around her as they waited for orders. Everyone ready? Joyra said into the speaking tube. Now we raise the weather light. All right, let's go on with the next one, Chapter 3. Dominaria coalesced around Gideon, and the first thing that struck him was the stench of rotting plants and dank earth. He stood on a high stone foundation between a ruined town and an overgrown stinking marsh, the landscape desolate under a cloud-covered sky. Gray stone structures once tall and graceful had lost sections of walls and roofs, and some were just heaps of tumbled stone. Mist cloaked the tall grass, bubbling mud pools and rotting trees of the marsh, empty of any life except clouds of insects. It was like an artist's attempt to visually capture a representation of death and failure. He couldn't suppress the bitter thought, how fitting for this moment. The second thing Gideon noticed was the hole in his shoulder and its piercing pain. He took a deep breath and did not stagger or collapse onto the muddy stone. Liliana, Chandra, and Nissa stood nearby, disheveled and shaken by the battle. This was not the time for him to show weakness. He made his voice even and moderate and admitted that did not go according to plan. Oh, it didn't? Liliana turned to him, putting on an expression of mock surprise. What makes you say that? Was it the river of undead I almost drowned in, or Nicobola slapping you around like a child's toy? Gideon was in too much plain pain for a clever answer. Besides, she was right. He stood there, wounded, barely keeping himself upright, 
his Cyril lost. They had failed utterly, been hopelessly outmatched, and were lucky to survive. The thought of how many others hadn't been so lucky was a sickening weight on his heart. Chandra rubbed her eyes. Where's Jace? Startled, Gideon looked around again. She was right, there was no sign of Jace. He's not still an Amonkhet. I saw him leave. Liliana's gaze crossed his. They had all known their meeting place. Jace's absence could be, couldn't mean anything good. She pressed her lips together and said, Perhaps he was delayed. He's not coming, Nyssa ground out the words, her voice harsh. He's given up. He wouldn't do that, Gideon was certain. Jace wouldn't abandon them. Nyssa ignored him, too angry to listen. A plane all but destroyed. So much death. She shook her head in disgust. And we played right into Bolas's hands. Chandra hunched her shoulders and looked away. Ajani was right. We should never have gone there. We had to try, Gideon began. Liliana turned to Nyssa, all calm reason. It wasn't a disaster. We killed Razaket. The rest, we couldn't have anticipated. Yes, your demon's dead, Nissa snapped. You got what you wanted and ran. You don't care about defeating Bolas. You're just using us to free yourself from your pact. Of course I want to defeat Bolas, Liliana protested. I ran to save my life, just like Jace did before me. Nissa persisted. And why here? She flung an arm out, gesturing to the dead marsh. How do you want us to risk our lives for you here? Your precious Ajani suggested we meet here, Liliana said, sounding aggrieved. Gideon noted she hadn't answered the question, and he had a bad feeling he knew why. But he said, Nissa, this isn't the time. We are all exhausted. Chandra said flatly, Your last demon is here, isn't it, Liliana? Liliana hesitated, and her calculating gaze moved from Chandra to Nyssa, but even she didn't have the gall to protest. Her jaw hardened, and, said, and she said, Belzenlock is here. Gideon let out a resigned breath. Of course he is. Nyssa. Liliana stepped toward Nyssa. If I wasn't restrained by my pact, we would have destroyed Bolas on Amonkhet. Her voice turning persuasive, she added, I can kill Belzenlock, but you're the only one powerful enough to help me. Gideon winced. He could see Nyssa was in no mood for flattery, and it was a measure of Liliana's disarray that she thought it would work. Liliana! Liliana! Chandra made a derisive noise. <laughs> you want to use her, like you wanted to use me. I thought we were friends, Liliana. Chandra, that's not helpful, Gideon said. Liliana ignored them both. Speaking only to Nyssa, she said, Belzenlock is worshipped here by the Cabal, a death cult. You can rouse the tree folk of Urbolg's Yavamaya Revenant, remnant to break into their stronghold where he hides and i can use the chain veil to kill him gideon grimaced the chain veil a powerful artifact of the onaki had allowed liliana to kill two demons but it sapped her strength and he thought it was far more dangerous to the wielder and possibly everyone else around it than she even she had admitted mrs lip curled no i won't help you i didn't take oath to save your skin she turned to gideon tell her Tell her we aren't going to let her use this again. Tell her that she can help us against Bolas or leave. Gideon took a sharp breath, managed not to wince the pain pulsing through his shoulder. Working with Liliana could be a real trial at the best of times, but they had made an agreement. We need Liliana's help to destroy Bolas, and she can't do that until this last demon is dead. Nyssa was incredulous. That will make her as much of an interplanar threat as Bolas. I don't believe that. Gideon tried to sound calm and reasonable, but pain sharpened his voice. She's not using us. It's the best chance we have against Bolas. And we can't leave Bells and Lock to wreak havoc on this plane. Nyssa, seething, Liliana said, I saved your life, Nyssa. This is how you repay me. I owe you nothing. Nyssa stepped back, contempt in every line of her body. None of us do. If the rest of you are too blind to realize that, I can't help you. She stepped away. Nissa! Chandra stared at her. If you don't want to help Liliana, I understand that, but Bolas! Gideon scrambled for a per persuasive argument, but pain scattered his thoughts. Nissa, you made an oath? No. Nissa backed farther away from them, her expression hard as marble. I can't bear to see another plane broken before I make my home whole. My own home whole. I'm sorry, but my watch is over. Chandra shouted, Nissa! 
but Nissa was already stepping out of the plane. For a heartbeat, her form glowed with green light, the air around her filled with the shadows of vines and leaves. Then she vanished, leaving behind the fading scent of green foliage and flowers. They stood frozen, the damp breeze stirring their hair. Liliana looked away, her jaw tight, clearly furious. Chandra buried her face in her hands, and Gideon suppressed a groan. He had to find Nissa, talk her into coming back, but pain stabbed through his chest with every breath. Then Chandra lifted her head and said, I'm going to. What? Gideon turned to her, appalled. The movement pulled at his wound and blood dripped down his side. Chandra? What? Liliana said incredulously. Are you joking? I'm not quitting, Chandra said rapidly, nothing but determination in her expression. I never quit. But you're right, Gideon. I need to learn from this. We failed Omnicat because I was too weak. Liliana sputtered. That wasn't why we failed. Chandra's chin, lif chin lifted. I have to become stronger. Chandra, Gideon tried. Chandra, when I said learn from failure, that's not what I... I know what I'm doing, she said, and before Gideon could take another breath, she was gone. Her form disappeared in a rush of fire as she walked from the plane. Gideon stared at the empty space where his two comrades had been. At some point he had lost control of the situation, and he wasn't sure how. Then the throbbing in his head was worse. Liliana rounded on him. Well, where are you going? Where are you going? What's your excuse? Gideon let out his breath warily. I'm staying. He looked down at her. Nothing has changed. We need you to destroy Bolas, and you need to destroy this demon. I... She stopped staring at him. Then her expression hardened again. Good. Then we should get on with it. We have to make a plan. Pain stabbed him again, worse this time, as if Bolas's claw were still in his shoulder. He set his jaw, breathed through it, and tried again. Oh, a plan. We have to. Liliana threw her arms in the air. I know you're wounded. Stop being a giant child and just admit it. She swore under her breath. Oh, come on. We'll find a place so I can heal you. Gideon was startled. I didn't know you could heal people. The list of things you don't know could fill all the archives of Dominaria, Liliana snapped. Now come on. Well, this is yet another disaster, Liliana thought as they followed an overgrown path down farther into the ruined town, with Nyssa quitting in a rage and Chandra flouncing off to find herself or whatever she had been babbling about. Liliana's strategy was as ruined as this town, and Jace, gone without a word. Perhaps he no longer wanted anything to do with her. That thought disturbed her more than she wanted to admit. She would find him again, talk him round, but she had to kill Belzenlock first. She cast a sideways glance at Gideon. Whatever happened, she couldn't let him realize she had run from the battle, just as Nyssa had accused her. He was all she had left, and she needed his help to kill Belzenlock. But there was a sallow cast to his brown skin, lines of pain and tension etched around his mouth. If he lives, the big idiot's wound must be must, must, must be much worse than he was willing to admit. Their boots squelched in the mud and scraped against broken paving stone and shattered glass. Death cloaked this town in the marsh around it, woven with the mist that drifted over the wet ground. Shades moved in that mist. Faces that appeared then faded away. Death was everywhere. The sight of this place had been another shock. Liliana couldn't believe this was Vess. If the others hadn't been standing beside her, she would have thought she had somehow plane walk, planes walked to the wrong part of Dominari. At least the town wasn't as deserted as it first seemed. Some of the stone buildings showed attempts at repair, with patched walls and roofs, cleared steps and wooden shutters for tall windows that had once held stained glass. The creepy marsh grass had been hacked away from a few courtyards, and one held tethered goats. A sense of something watching made Liliana examine a roof line more carefully. The shape near a chimney was no gargoyle, but not an angel, she thought. A visit from the sanctimonious Church of Sarah would have been the perfect cap on this foul disaster of a day. It was an Avon soldier on the wa on watch. Sorry, Avon soldier on watch. The cloudy gray light glinting on its armor, the white of its feathers and folded wings. Ahead over the rooftops, the stone curve in an ancient Thran ruin moved out of the mist, the smooth sides dark with moss. It was shaped like an axe blade, as if a giant had driven it into the earth and left it there. 
but that at least was a familiar sight. But something that hadn't changed in all the decades she had been gone. Check out that picture there. That's pretty cool by Titus Lunter. I've met him at a GP before. Really nice guy. Around the next turn was a broad plaza surrounded by tall houses, all in disrepair, but some with stained glass still glinting in the narrow windows of the upper floors. To one side was a fountain and a few wooden market stalls. Near the market stood a tall, rambling building that must be an inn. Smoke issued from the chimneys and the doors stood open. The people gathered in front stared curiously at Liliana and Gideon. All were well armed, but made no hostile moves. Gideon nodded a greeting to them, then ruined the effect by gasping and grimacing in pain. This was the center of town, and it looked as if it was barely clinging to life, a pale shade of the bustling market plaza that had once been as familiar as the back of her own hand. Liliana swallowed back a curse. What happened here? What is it? Gideon asked quietly. Liliana grimaced. She hated showing weakness. Nothing. Gideon sighed. If we're going to do this, we have to be honest with each other. Liliana snapped. It's nothing. As he eyed her skeptically, she reminded herself he was her only ally. And really, there was no point in concealing this fact. There's no grand conspiracy. It's just that this place has changed. The last time I was here, this town was surrounded by forest, not a stinking mosh. Gideon's brows drew down as he took in the plaza. Why couldn't you just say that? Because it's nothing, Liliana said through gritted teeth. That's exactly my point, he winced and cut the words off. Why were you here? It's where I was born. She ignored his startled expression. Come on, before you fall down, you're too heavy for me to drag. Liliana didn't even need to threaten anyone to get service, though the inn was clearly functioning as a, host, as a host, hostelry, in name only. The innkeeper seemed frankly astonished at the idea that they wanted to stay, but immediately led them to a room on the first floor, no doubt chosen because Gideon was leaving a blood trail and didn't look capable of climbing the stairs. The innkeeper was a large, dark-skinned man with an abundant family who kept popping out of doors to stare at the visitors as they made their way down the corridor. The room was expansive and contained a bed and a random assortment of musty furniture. Liliana steered Gideon to a low couch and helped him collapse onto it. It's been a long time since we had any travelers, the innkeeper admitted as he built up the fire on the hearth. A young woman, dressed in practical work clothing with a short sword belted to her waist, carried in a bucket of water to pour into the hearth's cauldron. A young boy brought a stack of folded blankets, a young girl appeared with a basket of bandages and healing supplies, and another boy came with a tray of food and drink. Despite Liliana's foul mood, there was no fault to find with the service. The innkeeper hadn't even asked to see their coins. I'll need whatever healing herb herbs you have, Liliana ordered. As the children left, she added, What happened here? This place has changed since I saw it last. It's the cabal, the innkeeper said, adjusting the cauldron's support so it hung over the growing flames. He added grimly, They mean to take over the whole world. Surely the man had to be exaggerating. Liliana brushed aside Gideon's fumbling attempt to remove his armor and undid the buckles herself. While he stoically pretended there wasn't a massive hole in his shoulder, Liliana set about cleaning and managing the wound. She had known Bells and Locke had supplanted the god Kubert to gain control over the Cabal, but their, that their stronghold was now in Urborg. But had they really spread so far? The Cabal has come here, then, to Benalia. 